Well, let me begin today by telling you a story about a time when Gretchen and I were still dating back before we were married. It was probably about, uh, oh, I don't know, 11 or 12 years ago, maybe at this point. I think we'd been dating for maybe five or six months. And Gretchen had, uh, she was moving, she was living at, at Laura's house and she was moving out and she was getting her own apartment with a friend of hers from college. And so on the day they were to move in, I, I came out and I gave up pretty much my entire Saturday helping to move in all of Gretchen's furniture and belongings. And not only that, but I remained afterwards and I helped her, you know, put things together and, uh, and I was hanging pictures on the walls and the whole, the whole thing even involved a trip to Home Depot on a Saturday, which is like the worst time to go to Home Depot. And so, um, you know, I just spent, spent a whole day and just worked really hard to help her get all moved in and settled into her new apartment. And like I said, we hadn't really been dating for all that long. And so in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I, gotta, I must be scoring some serious brownie points right here, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's what's going through my head all day long. And then at the end of the day, once we were all, once we were all done and everything was moved in, and all of the decorations were hung on the wall, her, her apartment was, was all set up, ready for her to just, to just live in. Uh, I was expect. I don't. I don't. Well, I don't really know what I was expecting. But but she came to me and she was just like, "Hey, thanks. You were a big help today." And I was like, "Well, that wasn't quite the reaction I was expecting." You know, I was expecting at least maybe she'd make me some supper or something. You know, but um, but you know, so I, I don't know. I was a little bit. Again, I don't know what I was expecting, but that just wasn't quite the reaction that I was expecting on that day. And so uh, I wonder if any of you have ever read a book uh, by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. The Five Love Languages. So it's a book that was originally written for, uh, for married couples, but then later on there's been several like expanded uh, editions of the book, and it, it can help you know, people in any kind of relationship, not just in marriages. But uh, anyway, the idea behind... The, the book, The Five Love Languages, is that, get, believe it or not, there are five love languages. In other words, there are five primary ways in which people tend to express their love to, to the people that they love. So, uh, well, and not only that, but the people who, uh, they also tend to sort of receive love according to those love languages, too. So let me just give you an example of how this works. Um, so one of the five love languages is gift giving. And if that is a person's primary love language, then if their spouse were to go out one day just on some random day, not necessarily like a gift giving holiday or something like that, and were to buy their, their spouse a gift, the person whose primary love language is gift giving, that will make them feel very loved by their, their partner. That will be a, a very meaningful gesture to them. But not everybody's primary love language is the same. What dictates a person's primary love language is a number of factors, but one of the big ones is how, how love was expressed when they were growing up. So how their parents or caregivers expressed love to them or, or didn't express love to them, that would help to dictate a person's love language. So, so in that same example I just gave where the, the person's uh, primary love language is, is gift giving, so when their spouse goes out and buys them a gift, that's going to make them feel very loved. Well, now their, their, their spouse's, uh, spouse's love language might not be gift giving. And so when they want to try to reciprocate that gesture, if they go out and buy a gift, it might not have the same effect uh, on their spouse that it did on them. And so let's see how we can apply this understanding of the five love languages to moving day with Gretchen. <laughs> okay, so my primary love language is deeds of service. And so for me uh, to go and spend my whole day and, and help her get moved in and help her hang pictures and help her get her apartment set up, that was me speaking my primary love language to her. Because deeds of service, that's how I tend to express my love to, to people. And that's when people perform deeds of service for me, that makes me feel very loved and very cared for. And so what I was doing is I was speaking my primary love language to her. But her primary love language is not deeds of service. It's words of affirmation. And so uh, that's the reason 
that my, my, what I did that day just didn't have quite the impact on her that I thought it would because I was speaking the wrong love language. And it's, that makes sense, right? If someone speaks to you a language that you don't understand, there's going to be that, there's going to be some tension there. You're not going to be able to, to quite communicate well with each other. Now, now there is good news there. And that is that you, you can learn other love languages. So even though Gretchen and I might not share the, the same love language, we can, you know, we can learn how to express love to one another speaking that person's love language. Hers is words of affirmation. So by speaking to her words of affirmation, I can make her feel uh, very loved. That's the best way for me to express my love to her. And I know that when she speaks words of affirmation to me, that she is speaking her primary love language to me. And so I can understand that that's what she's trying to do is express her love to me. And even though that might not be my primary love language, I, I can understand what she's doing there. And so what I've learned over the years in our marriage to, to accept that as the loving gesture that it is. Okay, so this is actually not a sermon on marriage or relationships or love languages. But I am going to tie that back in a little bit later on. Uh, what we are actually going to be looking at today is the very beginning of First Corinthians, the Paul's first letter to the house church in Corinth, or the house churches in Corinth, probably more accurate. Um, and so we're actually backtracking a little bit. We started a new series in First Corinthians last week. And now we're kind of uh, taking a step back and we're going to be looking at this, uh, this opening passage. So it's going to be 1 Corinthians verses 1 through 3. It's only three verses, so I didn't even bother putting it on the screen. Um, before I read it, I just want to go back and emphasize one more point from that, that little illustration I gave with the five love languages. And this is just say, I just want to make sure I word this very carefully. Um, learning how to speak and understand one another's love languages can help us to grow and strengthen our relationships with one another. Okay, so learning how to speak and understand one another's love language can help us to, to grow in and strengthen our relationships with one another. All right, so the first three verses of 1 Corinthians. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, yes, that's right. I'm preaching a sermon out of Paul's greeting in this letter. And I know that it is like a, a really, really fascinating topic. So you all probably know everything there is to know about it. But let's begin today by talking a little bit about the practice of ancient letter writing. You all know everything there is to know about that, right? Because it's such a fascinating topic. OK, um, so in. In ancient letter writing, like the, the type of uh, letters that people would have written to one another in Paul's time, uh, his greeting here, these first three verses of this letter are actually, they're pretty close to the way any letter uh, in ancient Greece would have started. Except for just a couple of little places where Paul, had, Paul tweaks that formula you know, just a, 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 an added word or phrase here, maybe just a little bit of a modification of a word or phrase there. But if we were to hold this up against another ancient letter written by just anybody, it could have been just, a, you know, a, a kid writing a letter to his mom or something like that. Uh, it would look, the greeting would look a lot like Paul's greeting here. If we were just focusing on the words on the page and the letters, they would be very close. But those few little modifications that Paul makes are actually pretty significant, I think. And really, it makes a lot of sense that, that Paul would adapt 
the language of his time and that he would adapt a convention like the, the convention of letter writing to, to serve his purposes. Because something that's interesting about human language is that it, it adapts to meet the needs of the community that uses it. So think about it. Um, 10 or 15 years ago or however long it's been, uh, before social media platforms like Instagram became popular, nobody knew what a selfie was, right? But now we all, well, most of us probably know what a selfie is. Because 10 or 15 years ago, there weren't people running around uh, giving peace signs and taking pictures of themselves with their phone and posting it on Instagram, right? And so there was no need for such a word as selfie. But when people started doing that, we needed a word to refer to that practice. And somehow we landed on selfie, right? And, uh, and also, you know, before the age of the internet, nobody knew what a hyperlink was or what a, uh, a, a URL is or what, you know, those kinds of things. So language adapts to meet the needs of the people of the community that use it. So this very new thing has come onto the world scene that is social media, and we've got a whole new vocabulary to go along with it. Well, keep in mind that in Paul's time, the Christian faith was a brand new thing on the on the scene. Like it was it was a new faith, certainly very closely related to the Jewish faith, but it was something different. It wasn't, it was not the Jewish faith, right? And so it makes sense that there would have to be these, these little changes in the language that the community of faith used to discuss their faith. Words like, uh, you know, Paul in this opening of his letter, he refers to himself as an apostle. An apostle did not mean at the time what apostle today means. Today, when somebody refers to an apostle, it has no other meaning but one of, one of you know, Jesus' disciples that later came to be known as apostles. Um, that word it has fallen out of use other than, you know, that, that particular usage. And the Christians are to blame for that because an apostle meant something else before the time of Christianity. So that's just one example. Now let's look at the, some of the examples of this that we can find elsewhere in this greeting um, that are maybe a little more significant than Paul's use of the word apostle. Um, so when Paul, you know, he addresses the letter, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And that's, that's a place where he modifies the greeting formula for an ancient letter, because it would be normal to address the letter to the church of God in Corinth. But when he goes on and he adds to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, now that's unique to Paul. That's something that he added on his own. And I think that that is pretty significant because not only is he modifying the formula of ancient letters, he's also modifying um, an ancient Israelite understanding of what sanctification is. When he refers to the saints and to those who are sanctified, that's a word that is the same word we would translate as holy. So he's saying um, to those uh, who are made holy in Christ Jesus, to those who are set apart for service to God in Christ Jesus. And we would have seen the idea of holiness in the Old Testament. For instance, like in Leviticus, uh, the 19th chapter, it says that uh, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Paul confirms here in his letter that indeed, uh, God's people are holy they are, because God is holy. But he goes on to add this important distinction. And that is that, that we are holy on the merits of Jesus Christ, his life and ministry, his death and resurrection and his exaltation. It's that which makes us holy. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we actually covered the importance of Paul addressing his letter to the saints and whatever place uh, that he was writing to in a recent sermon series we did where we were examining our dominant narratives against the narrative of Jesus. 
But I do believe that it is very significant that Paul addresses his letter to the saints in such a such place. I think like seven out of his or seven of his letters are addressed that way. Because when Paul when Paul writes that in his letters, immediately he's reminding his his readers that that we are sanctified in Christ Jesus, that we are called to be holy, that we are set apart for service to God, and he's reminding us of what it is that God has done for us. He's reminding us uh, right at the beginning of his letter of the, the merits of the cross by which we are free not only from the guilt and penalty of sin, but from the power of sin as well. I quote this scripture a lot, but I just feel like it's worth quoting. And that's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new, new creation. Behold, everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So by addressing his letter to the saints in whatever place that he's writing to, he's reminding us to embrace our identity as new creations in Christ. And he's reminding us of the love of God that has the power to drive things like envy and greed and bitterness and anger and hatred out of our hearts and to, to replace it with love for God and God's children and a desire to serve God's kingdom. And so it's no small thing that Paul adds those few words to the, in the greeting of, of his letters to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. It might be just a slight change, but there's a lot of significance behind that. So now let's go ahead and let's skip to the end of this greeting, where Paul writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, this is another case where Paul's, Paul's words are very close, very close to what an ancient letter would have contained. In fact, if, if we wrote it out in the Greek, those words where he says, where he says grace, that would have been very similar uh, to a to a, a Greek greeting, a, a word that would have just been translated as greeting. He just changed a couple of letters, and I think he was doing that because he was trying to sort of appeal to the Greek readers. But instead of simply saying greeting, greetings to them, he says grace to you and peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, maybe just a few letters different, but it makes a huge difference here in the way Paul writes this letter. Now, the best evidence we have tells us that Paul was the first person to use this greeting. I mean, he may not have actually been the first person, but if he wasn't, we don't have any historical record of that. He was the first person to write a letter and to include a greeting that says grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure that most of you are regular Bible readers. And and since Paul does include something similar to that greeting in many of his letters, it probably sounds familiar to you, but it might sound familiar to you for another reason. And that is that I I almost always greet all of you on Sunday morning by saying uh, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's the way I often start our YouTube videos on our, our YouTube channel, even though I haven't done many of those lately. And, and my reason for doing that is not just because it's a pleasant sounding greeting, although I think it is. And the reason that I start my the, these services that way is not merely because I'm trying to uh, emulate the apostle, although I am. Uh, it's because each time that I greet all of you, I want our minds to turn, even if it's just for a moment, to our Lord Jesus and to be reminded of Christ's gift for us, God's grace, and that grace that allows us to take our, our rests and have peace knowing uh, that, that God is with us uh, and to, to rest in that peace that we have that only God can provide. And why is it a good idea for us to be reminded of that so often? 
Why? How much time do we got? I can come up with a few reasons. Um, let's talk about God's grace. Now, we need not look too far here in our scripture to find some good stuff on God's grace. And we, of course, are a Methodist church, so we are we are firmly rooted in Wesleyan theology. And God's grace is, of course, an important point of emphasis in Wesleyan theology. We talk about God's prevenience and convicting grace, that, that grace which awakens us to our, our need for God. And the fact that we are sinners in need of forgiveness that calls us to Christ uh, to repent. We talk about God's grace that is justifying and sanctifying grace that that frees us from the guilt of sin and also from the power of sin. Grace that drives love for things of the world out of our hearts and replaces it for love uh, for God, God and God's kingdom. We talk about glorifying grace. God's work of grace in us that says that as Christ was exalted, so shall we be exalted with Christ. That grace that says that when we, uh, when we struggle for the gospel of Christ, when we endure hardships, that means that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so why not, why when we greet each other would we not want to be reminded of that? In 1 Corinthians, if we just were to read on a few verses beyond what we've already read today, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 4 through 9, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when Paul greets you, grace and peace, in the name of uh, Jesus, when I greet you, Jesus Christ, in the name of our grace and peace, in the name of Jesus Christ, what I'm trying to remind you of is the fact that you are being strengthened by the grace of God, that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift, that God is revealing Jesus Christ to you, and that uh, that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you share in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that those are all gifts of God's grace. When we start turning through 1 Corinthians, we'll read about these miraculous gifts of healing and things like that. If we turn to the letter to the Ephesians, we hear that Paul has called us to be, uh, to be pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers and uh, there's one that I left out, but I can't think of what it is right now. But he called us to be all of these things. And those are all gifts of God's grace. So, of course, we should be reminded of these things often. What did I say? Prophets? Evangelists. That was the one I forgot. Okay. Now, if we were to turn over to the book of Philippians, um, you're more than welcome to do that if you want. You don't need to. Um, just a little bit further from where you are now. But Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. These words may be very familiar to you. Actually, this passage is the most highlighted passage on the, the Kindle app. Another word that we wouldn't have known 10 or 15 years ago, right? No one would have known what a Kindle app was. Um, but this is what it says. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, be made, made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And so 
Here, I, I love the way that Paul writes this. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And we know, of course, that when Paul uses this kind of rhetorical, these rhetoricals, like if there is this, the, the uh, implied answer is yes, of course there is, right? And, and he thinks, he wants us to think about these things. So when, when, when I come to you with a word of greeting, straight away, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, I want you to think about those things that are pure, that are pleasing, that are commendable, that are excellent, that are worthy of praise. Because to think about those things, it's a, it's a safeguard. It's a safeguard against things like, like doubt, like worry, like temptation. And it says here that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says later, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly what, uh, you know, what the Apostle Paul means by the word peace here. Peace actually has, you know, kind of a number of different reasons, but I think it probably has to come from the, the Greek shalom, or the Hebrew shalom, rather. Um, of course, Paul was a, you know, a, a Jewish Christian, so that makes sense that he would be so influenced by, by uh, you know, the Hebrew way of thinking. So shalom, a sense that everything as it is as it should be, because everything belongs to God. Uh, this, when you greet somebody saying peace, the idea is to remind them or to wish upon them the fullness of blessing and, and well-being that is characteristic of God. It's that peace that is a safeguard against doubt and worry and temptation. So again, Paul greeting the church in Corinth saying to them uh, grace grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It might not seem like a particularly significant thing, but I, I think it is. I think it was important for Paul to greet them in that way. I've studied the writings of the Apostle Paul uh, quite a bit. It's probably the... Uh, the, the, the part of the Bible that I've studied the most, except for maybe the Gospels. And I've come to learn that I don't think the Apostle Paul was in the habit of wasting ink. He chose his words very deliberately. He's a very careful writer, as any good writer should be. And so when he greets the, the church in Corinth, saying to them, grace and peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he had a good reason for doing that. You know what's interesting, though, is it's very rare that I hear Christians today greet each other in that way. I don't always do it, of course, either. I mean, I start our services like this, but uh, when I see a friend like out at the coffee shop or something, I don't go up to them and say, uh, you know, grace to you and peace. God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but, but maybe I should. Like, uh, seriously. Like, I, well, I don't know why it is that we don't greet each other that way. I, I kind of I, I speculate that maybe it's uh, something that's left over from, you know, all of the, the hostility that existed between um, the, the Protestants and the Catholics in like the Reformation era when they were literally fighting wars against each other. Maybe the, the Protestants were just trying to distance themselves as much from the Catholics as they could, and the Catholics would have been the ones that would have probably been more likely to, to greet each other in such a way. But I mean, that's, I, don't, I, I don't think that there's, I think we've learned from that experience and there's not that same hostility 
between the two groups anymore as well. There shouldn't be. And yes, to greet somebody by saying, you know, grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that would be, seem a little bit strange. That doesn't really, that's not really a very colloquial greeting. That's not the way people tend to greet each other in modern day English. But I just wonder if we can maybe adopt some habits like that. Start sort of speaking to one another in, in biblical language like that. When we learn to speak one another's love languages, it helps us to, to grow in our relationship, to strengthen our relationship together. If we, if we started learning how to greet one another in Christ, to greet one another using biblical language, if every time we ran into a, a, a brother or sister in Christ and we were reminding that person of the grace and peace of God, if we were reminding them of Christ's gift to them, if we were reminding them of these things that are, that are worthy of praise, that are honorable, reminding them that Christ died for them, uh, reminding them that God has given you, us everything we need. We no longer fear uh, sin or death. We, we no longer fear uh, inadequacy. We know that God has given us grace to serve God and God's kingdom. We know that we have, have peace because every, the, the world and everything in it is God's. And if every time we said hello to one another, that greeting came out, as, uh, as a reminder of those things, I just wonder if it, if it wouldn't help us to grow in our relationship with God. Like we've learned to speak of, uh, God's love language. So I know this might be a little wacky. Let's do this. Next week when we come to church and we greet each other, let's say to one another, Grace and peace in the name of Jesus Christ. And when they, when someone says that to you, think about all of the significance that's behind it. I know you can't think of like a, a 30 minute sermon and like a, a 10 second greeting. But when someone says that to you, they are reminding you of the gift of God's grace and of the peace we have in knowing that the, that the world is God's and everything. In. And as uh, you know, like it says in Romans, a, a passage of scripture that was so important to John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Um, we have assurance of the forgiveness of our sins and that God calls us God's children. So when we say to each other, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we're reminding one another that we are children of God. And it's not just a nice sounding greeting. Let's try it. I'm going to do it if nobody else does. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so grateful that, that we do have the assurance of our salvation. We, we're grateful for the fact that, that your spirit, the Holy Spirit, witnesses to our spirit that we are your children. God, we're grateful for all of those gifts of grace that you give us that uh, I can't even really fully describe, but uh, your grace that is conforming us to your image, your grace that is uh, helping us to grow in love for you and love uh, for one another, and that grace that says that, uh, that we will be glorified with you. And so, Lord, we just long for that day where we see you face to face. And as we greet one another, Lord, and we, we greet each other in your name and, and according to and, and wish upon one another the grace and peace. Let us just be reminded of, of who we are, as, of our identity as new creations um, because of your gift of grace, God. We love you, Lord, and it's in your precious name we pray. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.